and welcome to my channel. My name is Emmy, and I have played Paladins for five years. And in that time, I really just fell in love with the support class. I recently got all of my supports to level 50, and I've learned some really great tricks along the way that really help turn the tide of a battle. For this video, I will be focusing on healing support, and I won't really be touching on damage support, such as focusing Lin Ying or Maelstrom Grok. I'll be putting my item buys for each one up on the screen, and I won't be including things like Wrecker or Illuminate, since those are situational buys that depend on the enemy team. Now, I want to state that these are beneficial to my playstyle, and they're not necessarily universal for all players. This is not a one-size-fits-all, so let's go ahead and get started. Why are we sitting around when our friends are in trouble? Ying is my highest level champion at level 225. I've played her for four of my five years in the game. With Ying, something that can place a good Ying apart from a great one is your clone placement and just where you are managing them in general. Not just for the maximum team healing, but also for anticipating escape with your dimensional link. Because if you're not managing where your clones are, it can render your dimensional link useless. When placing clones, you don't want to put all of them in the center lane. Though it can be nice to have so much healing on point, allocating one clone to the center lane can be most beneficial in a lot of cases. And when placed there, it needs to be in an alcove or at least behind your tank and not in front of them. The positions may look like one of these, so putting it behind walls or in alcoves that also can heal flank routes should they be there. And it allows you to have that escape when you need it. Great ones also include putting them up on areas like this walkboard here. Putting them up there is great and it can keep it out of the eye of enemies to keep your teammates being healed for longer. The second one is great to put on a flank route or an entrance to one. So you have an escape to get away if someone were to flank you and you also might find teammates there who can help you with whoever is attacking you. These are some great placements you could think about whenever you're working with flank routes. You don't always need to put them on them, but just putting them at the entrance of one can help your retreating flanks and damages to just get that burst of healing they need to either get away or get that last shot in. By also putting them over or behind walls, it gives you an extra barrier to escape. So something along the lines of this one, it can be really disorienting for the flanks who are looking for you, for you to be nowhere in sight anymore. Your clone placement should absolutely change with the battle, so this is just talking about with capturing point, but they should definitely change with the battle depending on what zones your team has taken or where they're exactly fighting in. My second tip is if you're healing, you really need to be running the life exchange talent. I know a lot of people love damaging, I do too, I get it, it's really fun. But when you're a main healer, you need this talent. She simply lacks the healing output a lot of teams require, and that makes you have to put both of those clones on point. Losing that advantage of flank healing or your escapes with dimensional link, it makes those escapes a lot harder. Sight beyond sight. Life beyond death. I alone traverse the abyss. Cirrus is a healer that has incredible damage abilities. Even with a full healing build, she's able to deal damage that other healers may not be able to. But if you prefer not to fight, you may be using your shadow travel when trying to avoid one. When being attacked by a flank, going straight into shadow travel can be a really good tactic, but you can be easily followed even when the enemy doesn't have Illuminate. Your audio cues can be extremely loud, especially on specific skins of hers, so you can be followed in your veil. So especially if you're full health, it may be worth landing four orbs on the flank and stunning them before shadow traveling away if you find it necessary. You're harder to track that way since you've gotten that head start, especially if you're not leaning in the direction you're retreating when you're veiling. When playing Ceres as a healer, I see a lot of people save her movement until they're attacked and use it as a getaway. While it is amazing for that, it's also a great tool to reposition that other healers just may not have access to. You can move through entire flank lanes or cross point to move from left to right side with no damage risk to yourself. Using it as a reposition tool is extremely valuable in a lot of fights. All souls need a fire to warm them and to light their way. Fury is an amazing healer just because of how great her whole kit is, and her movement is really no exception to that. 
Wings of Wrath can seem underwhelming and unhelpful, however, it's most useful when you're jumping it before you use it. This sends the projectiles in the direction of your crosshair and makes them much more reliable in hitting enemies. You can do up to 600 damage in all at 200 each projectile. And for each projectile you hit, you generate 1% ult charge. So using it often is key since Furious Ult can really change the tide of a battle and it has a pretty low cooldown. It's also a useful ability when champions like Ash are attempting to knock you off a cliff as you're knockback immune during that ability. When ulting, it's just not wise to ult to save yourself at low health. You get that few seconds of immunity, but if you're that low and no one's there to help you, you're likely going to die and you're not going to be able to reap the benefits of that ult, and it probably wasn't good timing either. When ulting, it is definitely wise to jump, especially when you're near a wall as it lets you move up, giving you that vertical movement. It gives you access to ledges where you may be able to stay safe for a moment from flanks who are coming after you. To me, Cherish is truly her only healing talent that is beneficial to use. Yes, Solar Blessing has enormous healing output, one of the highest in the game. However, it also takes a huge tool out of Furious Kit. Her beam is often essential to keeping her up during a battle, and truthfully, I rarely see Furious who can hit the beam on a tank and not over or undershoot it. It's also eliminating your tank's ability to move as much as they should on point and dodge and weave out of the ways of bullets and abilities. I just would not recommend using this talent. There's a lot of downsides to it with very few upsides. Magic is the culmination of art and science, the very essence of this realm. Rei is who I'd consider to be my main next to Ying. She can be such a hard champion to use, but she is devastating to play against when she's used correctly. I often see people play the extension talent, however, I don't really think this is a great talent. By no means is it bad, but it's just common for new players to Rei, but it does make her healing worse. If it has to travel this far each time, it's going to take longer to go back on cooldown, since it won't until the ability is finished. Focus, which I originally did not like myself, is a fantastic talent. It's a steep learning curve, but it is rewarding. Aiming the spirit link accurately can be difficult, especially on a busy point with lots of enemies and allies, but it can become second nature with practice, similar to aiming Makoa's hook. Putting aside that it will have massive healing output to link targets when using Spring to Action as a card, it also supercharges your team's ultimates. Instead of the base spirit link charging 0.5% of the allies linked ult, it will now charge 1.5% a second, which can be amazing on champions like Fernando, who can really change a fight by ulting. When used in conjunction with ult cards such as Refreshing Break, which also makes your chain heal ult charge, it charges your team extremely quickly. When you link to an ally or an enemy, the link will always last 4 seconds regardless of the distance or walls. So when linking to an enemy, you will be guaranteed to do 600 damage to them without them having Haven or a clean of CC. When your flanks run ahead and you link to them, you can also heal them for that 600 for at least 4 seconds even if you can't physically get to them to use your chain heal. There's just a lot of pros to using this talent even if it is a steep learning curve for you. When do we get paid? After we win? Pip is a really fun champion to heal with. When using his potions, I feel it's important to have the cards Medical Excellence and Reload. Reload is a great card, but you need to keep track of it properly. Using the potion two times back to back is not always the most beneficial tactic, and when the card is on cooldown, you'll see it right here in the bottom corner. It may be wise to wait till it's off cooldown and not use your potion immediately unless the situation really calls for it. Then you have to wait the whole 7 second cooldown on your healing potion, as opposed to the 5 seconds for the card cooldown. Using medical excellence can actually allow you to heal champions easier in midair and heal people through walls. When you throw your potion, you can refire to detonate it, healing the target mid-air, and medical excellence can kind of make that estimation easier with a bigger radius. But when you have teammates dying through walls, you can often give them a boost through the wall with your potion. Pip's healing potion is not stopped through walls, and the effect will still hit its radius on the other side. Utilizing Cornus is especially great for this, and can save your flanks and damages who are in losing fights, and give you access to the enemy backline while never really going in there yourself. Pray to your gods. The spirits care not. 
Dumba, in my opinion, is a very hard healer to truly master, but it is super rewarding when you do. Learning how to use your gourd is a huge part of playing him. His gourd can bounce off of geometry in the map, so be careful where and how you throw it down since it can get stuck on the floor's crevices and bounce. That being said, you can also bounce it off walls to throw it around a corner. I also often use my gourd to help zone my team. It helps them choose when to push, and when I prime a push with a gourd farther down forward, they also are pushing into the healing and it gives them the confidence they need to go forward. This can also be helpful when trying to push a tank on a point who is hanging in your backline instead of on point. It can give them confidence to push forward or make the healing only accessible if they push forward. Anticipating where fights will turn is the key to using Gord correctly, keeping in mind that it also damages the enemy team. When your team is healthy, you can use it to throw around your flank lines to see if the flank is lying around the corner and waiting. When picking a talent for Dumba, Spirit's Chosen is just the best healing card. Ripen Gord looks very good, but you lose so many of those things that I just talked about. It's uncommon that I see a team do well with this type of Dumba because it causes you to lack damage similar to the Fury of Beam card. His Gord does 55 per 0.2 seconds, that being around 255 a second, which is a lot of damage to be lacking for your team. You bring war to my doorstep. I bring destruction to yours. Genos is a really great champion, but what can make him even better is when he's played in conjunction with a champion like Cassie, Cirrus, or Inara. These champions make his ultimate much better. Rarely do you see a Genos blind ult and get tons of kills. On maps like Ice Mines, you can anticipate enemies at the very start and get quite a few kills out, but other than those niche circumstances, it's just not really very easy to use. If you're looking to do a team that synergizes with him, someone that can bring the enemies together like Cirrus or reveal enemies like Cassie are amazing combos to really hurt the enemy team. It can be devastating when you take out three of their members simply with good teamwork dynamic. Using the card Astral Cycle at 5 is really important since with Kronos 3 you're marking a third person a few seconds before the duration of another is up. Double marking someone in an intense fight when others are not necessarily low is something super helpful since they get that 330 burst upon application and the 220 for 1 second for 10 seconds. You can get up to 12 seconds of that with Astral Cycle. Let our grace pass on to you to protect, to save, to fight. When running Io, I often use her Goddess Blessing talent over her Lifelink talent because I just feel like it can make Luna a bit too much of a target. When Luna is taken down, it can severely hurt your team and you're left with only your Moonlight, which isn't going to heal as much as it would if you were using Goddess Blessing. By no means is it a bad talent, and I've used it in specific circumstances, and it can be situationally good, but I just feel like more often than not I'm using Goddess Blessing. Since Luna is not healing when I'm using that card, I use her as a turret for myself and others in the backline. Using the card Protector makes Luna an asset for your healing while not being essential to your healing. The stun Luna provides is extremely valuable to you. The first shot on a flank or the first shot a flank gets on you in your backline means Luna will attack and stun them, giving your team time to react. This can be devastating to flanks like Androxus, May, Vora, flanks who rely on movement to get out of the way of your bullets. If you decide to run lifelink, it is really important to have Luna on point. When Io hordes her in the backline to self-protect, you're robbing your tank of the best healing you have in your current kit. I see a lot of Io's do this and usually our team is suffering from that because we're not getting the proper healing we need, especially the tank on point. Don't worry, you'll only feel a small pinch. Since Lilith is very different from other healers, casting from her own health bar to heal others, she requires a bit more of a risk and reward approach. There should never be a time you don't have your hex on somebody. Without it, you're not regenerating your blood pool, i.e. your health bar. This makes you not only vulnerable, but it makes you unable to cast when you need to. Marking an enemy gives you less blood pool in return than marking an ally, so it's more beneficial to mark an ally, especially since marking an enemy reveals you to that enemy for the duration of the mark. When marking an ally with Hex, it's much more beneficial to allow it to go the full 10 seconds. It is not a 
stagnant healing over that entire mark it grows as it's on them longer so constantly changing your mark once the cooldown is done can be more negative than positive since it's not giving time to build up to that healing the card blood cannon is a card that's best to run at five you do not need your normal health since your blood pool is what really matters you can regenerate that extremely easily with your hex unlike your normal health bar which is not going to regenerate in the same way if you're worried about your low health, Veteran adds to your normal health bar and not your blood pool. So even by lowering your health, you can just put it back up later with Veteran. I will save the realm, no matter the cost. Corvus was actually my last hero that I got to level 50. Not because he isn't good, but because he just didn't mesh as great with my playstyle as a healer. But that being said, I did play him as a hypermobile healer, never really staying in one place too long. Their team is constantly looking for you more than I notice with other healers. You make their damages and flanks harder to kill in those 1v1s, making your flanks more likely to come out on top with them, so they're going to look for you more than they do other healers necessarily. So when playing him, I choose to never stay in one place for very long. In fact, I move almost as soon as my cooldown allows. Moving to places I just saw their flanks and damages leave and believe that they just cleared is a really good tactic that I noticed, but you have to be very hyper aware of where they are at all times. That's the key to this playstyle. When trying to escape a flank, if I'm healthy enough, because this is not a good idea to do when you're at one tap, I'll use my projection up into the air and then ult. This puts you really high up into the skybox where you may be much less susceptible to flanks like Seven or Sky, who often need that close range to get you lower. Holding your ult and not using it immediately lets you keep that 60% damage reduction and CC immunity so your team can help you by taking out that enemy while you're safer in the sky. It also does allow you to move a little bit, so you can also move up onto higher ledges that may have a better vantage point or where you can get away from flanks who don't have movements to follow you. Is it winter already? When using Grover, he's another support that I tend to play more hypermobile, and I never really stay in one place too long. Especially since the changes to his rampant blooming talent, this is a great playstyle. Using your vine is extremely helpful to your team and allows you to constantly reposition keeping flanks off of your back. Running the card vine grasp at 3 or higher also makes you able to practically throw yourself across lanes and sometimes across the map while also healing your team with the vine in conjunction with your blossom. The recommendation I have when using vine is if you don't need necessarily go anywhere, but there are burst damages like Willow or Betty or Bomb King on point, vining straight up on a wall will give you that height to get away from their AOE, but also allow you to heal your team right down below. Hear my battle cry of fury! Whoa. Brock is my least favorite of all the healers, but that is a personal playstyle preference, so that doesn't mean he's not good. His Spirit's Domain card is great, though it cuts his damage down terribly. When running this card, you should focus on cards for your ammo and add totem buffs in the spare spots. Electrostatic and Thunderlord are great cards to add to your deck if you run the Spirit's Domain build. When using your totems, you can stack the benefits with multiple totems. So, if your deck has Spirit's Grace, it will also stack the movement buff. However, Gale only reduces the cooldown of one totem and not all totems currently on cooldown. 